Hello. Hello. Happy post uh, KubeCon, everybody. <laughs> we survived. Yay. My mind is, is, is still very, very full. <sighs> yeah, it was a rough week. It was an awesome week. Ex <laughs> exciting, but rough. I wanted to watch all the things. Oh, hey, Bartek. Uh, Matt, you were a little, your following was a little bit too low for me. I don't know if it's the same for the others. I can say that yours, Arthur, is very, very high. <laughs> I almost went deaf. <laughs> yeah, I was being careful to not blow out your drums with levels that are too high. I guess we'll wait just another minute. It's Richie. We have a fun agenda today. Yeah. I guess Richie won't be joining us, but given what he said early on, uh, he would be around here already. Oh, okay. Oh, gosh. Okay. Let's, uh, let's start in, um, in, let's say, a minute. So if you haven't yet signed in, please do. I will link the Google document. All right, and while we get started, this is a CNCF. Um, uh, meeting, the code of conduct applies, and as usual, we are kind to our colleagues, as we are. Um, so today we have a couple of uh, uh, we have a couple of guests uh, we're, that are going to do some quick presentations. Um, uh, they're listed in the agenda. We've got uh, the author of uh, Prom Dump, Ivan Sim, uh, and we also have uh, a very cool talk by Pixie. Uh, uh, so Zane is going to walk us through uh, Pixie Labs. Um, what they've been up to. Um, I wanted to extend a welcome to everyone who may be here for the first time. Uh, if anyone is here for the first time uh, or you've never introduced yourself before, do you want to take a quick second and just say hi? Oh, hey, um, this is my first time in this meeting. Um, Arthur invited me because I was very interested in hearing what Pixie has to say uh, for the PPF staff. And I'm Lorenzo. I work at Gitpod with, Gitpod with Arthur. Um, that's it. Ciao, everyone. I'm Italian. Sm small world. Small world. Hey, I can introduce myself. I've been lurking on the channel a little bit, and I attended a few other meetings. My name is Dave Grisanti. Uh, I work at Comcast, and I'm just we do a lot of stuff with durability. Most of it not very. Um, homogeneous. So I'm trying to get some uh, things going there and I've just been contributing on and off. So happy to be here. What? Can... Hey, everybody. My name is Ivan. I work for Red Hat. Yeah, first time here. And um, I got a cool email from Matt who invited me to join to come and share like a personal site project that I've been doing. Um, so yeah, happy to be here. Cheers. Hey. Hey guys, I'll introduce myself. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. I've been attending off and on, uh, just on the side, never introduced myself. My name is Mohammed. I work for Seagate. I work in their open source program office as well as some other um, stuff. And observability is definitely hot on our, um, you know, topics to kind of do more work on. So it's been great to kind of see what you guys have been producing. All right, uh, I'm Michelle, and I, I guess I'm here with saying just to talk about Pixie. So I'm super excited to be here, and I think we're both very excited to show you guys what we've been working on. Great to have you. Thanks. Welcome. Hey, I'm I'm Matthias. I haven't been here for a while. I think I joined the first couple of meetings and then um, transitioned to another company. Previously worked at Red Hat. Now I work at Polar Signals. So hi everybody again. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Anais. I'm mainly here today because of the presentation, because I'm really curious about Pixie. Uh, I just joined the SRE team at Sivo, and before that, I worked at Codefresh. Cool. Okay. That's everyone that we haven't. Cool. Thank you for um, saying hi, everybody. I don't, I don't think we missed anybody. Um, so I'll just take a very quick, brief minute at the top. Uh, last week, um, you know, we talked about launching some initiatives for 2021. Um, I'll follow up with this with, with a blog a little bit later today. Uh, but very quickly, I won't go through them all in detail, but uh, we have about five or six, depending on how you count work streams. And in the last week, um, there have been a couple of additional suggestions. So um, if there's no uh, objections, uh, I think we'll plan that we'll just use GitHub projects um, and we'll make a, a Kanban board for you know the definition of, of working groups. So if you're interested in uh, some of the things we talked about last week, um, and again, I won't I won't elaborate, but they were generating a big giant list of uh, vendors and the projects they contribute to, uh, a, a plan for engaging with other CNCF projects intentionally over the year, um, um, with a prioritization and, and, and like a common uh, interview template, if you will, um, plan for and foster in-person meet meetups once uh, the world gets vaccinated, um, generating personas and curating case studies, the compendium of case studies, uh, um, uh, case studies and other existing content that uh, we want to surface uh, from CNCF members uh, and partners. Um, uh, so those were the five that we talked about last week. Uh, if folks are interested, I think we'll we we can collaborate in GitHub and Slack, uh, and then maybe uh, in the two weeks from now, uh, we can we can present once we've sorted it out online together. Uh, how we want to self-organize and self-manage but a number of people have reached out to me personally and said hey i'm really interested in helping driving one of those things so that's awesome to see so with that um i don't want to take up any more time on administrative than is needed uh so if there's if there's nothing else uh pressing um why don't we start with ivan and then move on to pixie yeah um thanks everybody thanks for having me um so yeah, today I'd like to share with you like a site project that I have recently built and pu published. And uh, it's basically a kubectl plugin that uh, allows like uh, SRE, SRE is to dump and restore like um, Prometheus um, persistent blocks. And um, a big thank you to Bartek who um, you know provided some feedback and take time out, out of his busy week um, to chat. Um, so I am gonna try to share my screen. So oh, I don't know about you guys, but clicking on the share screen button is always a gamble for me because it might crash my <laughs> thing. And <laughs> but, um, can you all see my web browser? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. Great. Um, yeah. So um, the gist of it is, um, you know, late last year, like um, I was talking to one of the Red Hat um, software engineers, and he told me that they have been like um, an increasing number of um, issues and bugs on our customers, um, OpenShift customers' um, clusters, where it would be super helpful if we can get access or, or dump of their Prometheus data. You know, like, uh, I mean, life would be a lot simpler if they can just give us their config file and then we just like um, port forward to their Prometheus um, console and do what we want there, but not gonna happen. So um, even up to you today, right? Like, um, you know, we usually tell like, um, you know, like um, the customer representatives to, hey, help us to capture like um, Prometheus data. And here's like, um, you know, like a 15 lines of um, bash code and try to run it in the environment. And what that bash um, scripts does is really just, um, it um, run like um, the kubectl exact command and then like um, really like attach to the container and then run like a tar command to archive and compress the entire data directory of Prometheus. Now, like uh, it becomes more challenging if it is like a production Prometheus um, instance with maybe 100 gig of data, 200, 500, you know, gig of data, right? Like um, as we like um, compress and tar up all this file, like we need to, and we try to restore it and say if it is like a 500 gig of um, you know data directory, it's almost impossible for me to run it on my laptop you know, to try to re just to reproduce like um, that, 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 that issue to see what's going on. I have to spin up clusters and then I have to port the file over, et cetera, et cetera. So um, 
you know, like just been thinking about it as like really like when we diagnose bugs, all we really care about is like a very specific um, chunk of data that falls within like a very specific um, time window. So, and then, you know, I just started researching into it. And as um, you folks might know, currently Prometheus like um, offer like um, two ways to dump data. And one of them is through like a um, prompt tool where it has like a TSDB snapshot sub command. And then there's also like a snapshot, like a HTTP endpoint. Both of them don't really do what we want because like, uh, first of all, like it, it dump everything that, you know, again, 200 gig of um, data metrics, which we don't need. Um, and then secondly, with prompt tool, like uh, there's a GitHub issue that I believe author raised about how like the output is somehow limited that you can really just like, um, you know, restore it onto another Prometheus instance. So that kind of led me to just do some like research like um, in the evenings, look through code and, you know, <clears throat> and try to find out like, uh, is, is there a way to do this? And it turns out that like um, Prometheus has this um, TSDB package that really offer like a very nice um, API as an interface that would do what exactly we wanted to do. Capture data blocks, but allow us to filter it by, um, by you know, like uh, time, time range. So that's kind of it. And uh, I want to go into a very quick demo. And really, there are only three commands that I need to run. So right now, I have two kind classes running. And one of them is sending a port 9090. Um, and then, you know, and this demo HTTP request total um, metric is just like a, a dummy metric that I created and just for demonstration purposes. And as you can see on this cluster, like um, there's some weirdness going on, right? Like uh, I said, my, the, the the summation rates like um, drop all of a sudden, you know, something, some weird stuff happened here. And, you know, and pretend this is like a 200 gigs of um, data directory. And you know, I don't want to, again, dump and restore the entire Prometheus. You know, I only care about this, this time frame here um, to, to help me to get into, um, to, to, to reproduce and diagnose the problem. Now I have a second instance of Prometheus listening at port uh, 9091. Let's do a quick refresh to make sure it's still there. And you know, if I try to do like a demo underscore, like you know, there's no the, the metric is not there. So what I want to do is really just to like dump the data and then port it over to the second instance of Prometheus. Um, can you see my console? Yes. Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, so I have like um, one kind of cluster running here, and um, the first thing I'm gonna do is just like um, so I'm gonna. The, the prompt dump is just a kubectl plugin, and uh, it provides like um, maybe like two sub commands and one main command. And um, oh, actually, let me just make sure I am looking at the right um, <clears throat> cluster. Okay, so I want to run like a, a very quick like um, meta like um, let me just make sure I'm pointing to the right cluster. Um, I want to get the, uh, the metadata of the TSDB uh, from here. So what that essentially does is like um, the, the plugin, the CLI, it like uh, upload, um, it send like a post request to the exact sub resource of the Prometheus container. And then it attaches to like the standard in and the standard out of the container. And then it just streams like a, a, a a binary, like a second application, essentially, stream the binaries into the container via its standard in, and then like um, you know, and tell the container to hey, you know, here's like a stream of data. When you get it, untar it and run this command, and then like um, stream back the output to me via standard out. So what we see here is um, you know, it give me a metadata, the meta, the meta sub command, like um, just give me a sense of how much data am I dealing with. So head blocks, persistent blocks, you know, details about Prometheus storage, um, TLDR, head block, in-memory, memory map files, uh, and mutable. Persistent blocks are like more like quote unquote long-term storage where think the data becomes immutable and like um, they get compressed and, you know, just safe on disk basically. And so as you can see, like uh, in my head block in memory, like I'm um, about like uh, what, 25K of number of series and the data size, uh, you know, how much is this? Maybe like 37 meg or something of data um, on persistent blocks. Um, so, you know, like you give me a sense of, okay, how much data am I dealing with, right? 
So now if I try to like um, just like um, dump the data that um, I'm interested in, uh, same part. And then if I switch back to my Prometheus um, console, so maybe I'm only interested in the data between say maybe around four o'clock and um, maybe two o'clock there. So I'm just gonna, I'll tell it to like um, go and look for this data. Uh, what date is this? This is uh, 11th. Um, the, all the time is all in like um, UTC. So, and then I go max time equal 20, 21, 11. And then say, well, what was it? Noon? Okay, let's say one o'clock in the afternoon. So, and then I'm just going to redirect the output to like a, a TASI file on my local file system. So, okay. So now like I should have a local file here. So 23 Mac of data, you know, again, not too bad. Say image pretending it's like 200 gig in total. So let's do a tar TF and see what we got here. Um, so essentially, yeah, it just captured like um, the, the data, the persistent block that falls under that period of time that I'm interested in. And at the same time, it will also like um, capture everything in the chunks head and the wall files. Chat with Bartek briefly about uh, briefly about this. I think like yeah, like the chunk the head block allows you to um, I guess like kind of query like the, the time range as well, but it's not as easy to split it. Um. So anyway, so I guess like I just took the easy way out and said, hey, you know, give me everything in the the head blocks and everything in the wall files, because those are pretty much like um confined to about like two hours of data anyway. So, you know, relatively small compared to all the other persistent blocks within the container. So yeah, so I got my data. Um, now I'm gonna switch over to my other cluster. I hope it's still running. Okay, so there it is. Um, so I do from the meta data just to see what is already in the container. So yeah, this is a new like, um, Prometheus instance that I just installed via Helm. And you can see from the, uh, the last column here, it's about, it's less than half an hour old. So not, there's no persistent data blocks yet. It does have some head block data though. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna run like um, the restore sub command, and then we go minus T and tell it to pick up this um, dump um, file. And I think that should be all I need. Okay, it was rather quick, relatively quick because you know just twenty seven meg of data, so not a lot there. Let's run the metadata again. Um, oops, did I pick it up? Okay, yeah. So now I can see, you can see like um, I have a persistent blocks here. So now for those of us who are more observant, you might notice that hey, you know how come there are two blocks here? Um, I think it has something like um, so they, you know, when I talk when I when the prompt dump like talks to like um. The TSDB, there's really no way to say like, hey, you know, like um, break up your persistent blocks, give, give me a quarter of it or half of it, you know. So you, get, you tell the TSDB, it's like, this is a time range that I'm interested in, a start time and end time, and you have to fetch basically the entire block, you know. So essentially, we might just end up like um, getting more data than we need. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, having more data, slightly more data, hopefully, is better than, you know, having missing data, right? So I restore it and um, then like, uh, you know, I am gonna have to restart my pod and the uh, Prometheus server has like um, a PVC underneath it. So killing the pod will not destroy the restore data. And the reason why I need to restore it is just to give Prometheus a chance to replay all the, 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 the wall files and pick up like, um, you know, all the data that has been restored. So, now I'm gonna like watch it and just, if I have done everything correctly, like, uh, you know, <laughs> this should not crash. Um, I had, when trying on um, OpenShift, like, uh, you know, sometimes like when after the data is restored, like uh, it will crash because it complains about like uh, the head blocks not being in order. Um, but that seems to happen like um, on OpenShift, but like we just playing vanilla, like Kubernetes kind of Minikube, like that just does, I don't see like, any data corrupt corruption at all so far. 
in all my testing with data restoration. So, okay, so it's restore. Now I need to redo my port forward to uh, the second instance of Prometheus because as we all know, port forward to service is really just port forward to one of the parts. Um, okay, so go back to my second instance. I do a refresh and then I should see my data here and let's execute it and see what does it look like. So we were looking at like a one day old time frame. So if I done it correctly, like uh, we should see something very similar, which, oh wait, wrong query. Let's try it again. Yeah, so um, if we compare the chart here, you know, it's almost identical, but not quite. Um, you know, there's some missing data. So what we're seeing here essentially is, um, I guess this is, um, there's not enough data here. I wish like, I have like, um, you know, two, or, actually, no, let's try this. If I look at, back at that, um, okay. In this case, it may have restored like everything that we need. I wish like um, there was a way for me, I wish I have enough data to show like, oh, you know, like uh, only this chunk show up and then this chunk didn't um, get restored because, you know, it, it falls under a different block. So, so kind of like what I was saying, right? Like um, I tell the TSDB that, hey, I need data from this chunk of time range. And then it's just, um, it just grab everything, the entire block or blocks in this case, and then just restore it. And here, like this slightly like um, the head chunk, uh, which is, you know, the part that got replayed as Prometheus part restarted. And this is the data that was um, for that restore and fall on that one or two blocks of um, persistent data blocks, because we asked for a time range that span between two blocks. Um, yeah, so this is one way, this is um, two, but anyway, so that's kind of it in general. So uh, I had a chance to demo it to our teams and the support team, um, you know, they found it helpful. helpful. So I, I hope that like, um, it will be something that the community community will find find helpful too. Thank you. Thanks. For, thanks Thank for you. This, Adam. Um, does anyone have a comment? I think we have a couple of minutes to chat before we move on to uh, Pixie. Uh, I have one comment and that is less technical. I shared it on, on the chat as well. And that is um, <laughs> you will probably find that people love to use it and will use it and they run into issues and they will come to you and ask for support, but will not be able to share data. I ran into a similar issue for an etcd backup tool that I wrote a couple of years ago. And it was not fun because you can't reproduce stuff if you don't have the data. And, and, and it's, you know, you can't blame anyone because obviously you can't just, you know, uh, give someone external a dump of, of your production system, absolutely not, but that is an issue. <laughs> And maybe you are smarter than me and find out some way around. I didn't. Uh, eventually, was very happy that Valero came up and I didn't continue that one. But that's certainly something one can run into. Yeah. Yeah. I'll... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Ivan. Go, Ivan. I, I have another question on the unrelated thing. Oh, like yeah, I was, I was hoping to actually, like, yeah, I opened up an issue on the Prometheus GitHub repo. I was hoping to like if there's en enough people interested in it, I can I can move the entire source code to Prometheus community repo, so others can help me to maintain it, and I don't have to spend like all my evenings trying to figure out bugs, bugs and stuff like that. But I always like I remind people that this is not like a backup and restore tools because this is like a just an SRE tool with a very specific SRE use case in mind, and you know Prometheus backup and restores entire thing, entire product that I have to quit my day, day job to do, but you know, this is just a SRE tool. So, but yeah, I, I'm hoping that will help scope the Hopefully only, function. only the SRE team would have exact access to a prod cluster. If yeah. They have it. yeah. Um, for sure. Yeah, and, and, and from my side, like it, it, it's a super nice demo and thank you. I think you can in next iteration actually improve it, uh, you know, and actually you can there is a way to select certain data that you want to actually dump. And, you know, uh, we could, we can kind of play with some tool that will essentially, uh, for example, remote read the data from Prometheus uh, using their APIs that selects actual series and time, time uh, and by, by series and time. And, uh, and 
essentially build the block ourselves because this is mm. what our backfilling tools in Prometheus already do from recording rules and from CSV and from JSON. So if we can point to the existing Prometheus, that could be another input for such a block, which could be much, much smaller because it will have only one series that you really care for. So this is you know, something which would more be make your tool even more lightweight, right? Um, and yeah, and we also, you're welcome to propose this project for Prometheus community uh, repository, but you know, also, it's worth to mention, this is not a way to just, uh, you know, just remove your this project from your kind of, you know, area of, of interest, because this is not like a, you know, random place for, you know, uh, maintainers with lots of time, <laughs> but it's rather like how to make sure um, it's more adopted, more visible project for everyone else, and you have higher chances, higher chances to have someone else to help you. Uh, but yeah, just ideas. Uh, to improve that. And also we can work on uh, better uh, importing procedure. Right now you have to restart the whole Prometheus and maybe even remove the actual uh, existing data uh, data directory. I mean, mm. there are ways to reload that dynamically or maybe even add blocks on top of other blocks and they will be vertically merged or vertically queried. And I think some of those things already are uh, uh, doable, maybe behind some flags, so we could, you know, improve this behavior as well. But just ideas, yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I did. I think I, I did came across. I gotta, some I gotta come in with my MC hat on, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and we gotta we gotta cut it. Thank you so much for showing us gotcha. the tool. Uh, please join us uh, in our Slack channel, and I bet uh, there are uh, lots of other ideas. And I actually, I'm interested in this discussion, but we need to move on uh, to to spread our time. So thank you so much again. Um, Zane, are you ready to present? Yep. Cool. Oh, so uh, Jeff, welcome. Uh, take it away. Cool. Well, let me. Sorry, do my share screen. Ah, notice it says SIG observability with the tag. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone for. Um, you know, having us over here, uh, you know, we're super excited to be part of the community. Uh, just, just for context, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Zane, uh, Zane Askar. Um, I'm currently the GM and GVP of Pixie, an open source at New Relic. And prior to this, I was the co-founder and CEO of Pixie Labs. Uh, and we were acquired at the end of, end of last year. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of go through the story of, you know, why we built Pixie and, and what Pixie does. And, you know, we'd love to get your feedback and, and your thoughts. And, um, as of about two weeks ago, uh, everything over here is is open source. So happy to you know uh, get feedback and also collaborate out on, on GitHub on, on building this out in the open. So why are we building Pixie now, and, and what problems are we aiming to solve? Um, you know, I, I'm not going to go through this entire like marketing pitch, right? But basically, software is more decoupled. Uh, you know, but we still spend a lot of time just like wrangling data and debugging and securing and managing our apps. Uh, for, for context, most of the Pixie team actually comes from a data and um, you know, data systems and machine learning background. And uh, observability is actually a you know, relatively new area for us. So um, you know, please feel free to provide us, provide us feedback. But some of the challenges we, we noticed is that you know, when we're building production systems, you, you usually land us spending a lot of time just adding adding a bunch of instrumentation. Uh, and a lot of this instrumentation is added up front. Some of it is added as the programs are, are built out and services are deployed. Uh, we wanted to find a way to do, I'd say like 80% of this automatically, quickly, or uh, in some way extendable after the fact. And we understand that, you know, in many cases, it's actually useful to manually add instrumentation where you have uh, specific business logic you need to capture. Um, another area where, you know, we really, uh, look at, especially as we started to tap into new data sources, is just like the sheer uh, data volume um, that's generated, especially we capture metrics, traces, and logs. And then you truck this all over to some centralized backend, which is usually hosted by some cloud provider. Um, and then just like extensibility of, of the interfaces. So one of the things we did with Pixie is that we kind of moved to this model where, you know, similar, I think in many ways, similar to Prometheus, everything is hosted inside of inside of the cluster. Um, but one of the differences being that, you know, we, we focus a little bit more on 
um, the the logs and traces, uh, even though we do we do metrics and are less optimized for for some of the metric use cases. But more specifically, you know, we moved away from having like very rigid predetermined collection to uh, to doing everything by code and then on on the fly, uh, no instrumentation collection. And then we'll see how this works uh, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, also, you know, Pixie moves away from a cloud only model to this Hedge Plus cloud model. Um, we, you know, uh, one of the things that I think someone earlier mentioned BPF, one of the things we heavily leverage is BPF inside of Pixie to automatically go and, and capture data uh, and also allow Pixie to be extended. Uh, part of the challenge over there is that you're basically flooded with so much data, it's, it's very difficult to even move it off the machine. So we have to build our compute platform to be able to handle all of this data while you know, it's sitting on the actual actual machines where it's collected. Uh, and then, you know, everything inside of Pixie is, is API driven and scriptable um, using uh, using this, you know, Python dialect called pandas, if you're coming from the data systems world, it's a pretty, pretty common uh, way to represent data programs. And then that's what we use in Pixie. So just from a perspective of what is Pixie, right? Again, it's instant code driven debugging. Uh, part of our goal is like how much data could we get you know, after installing Pixie for, for less than five minutes, right? So uh, that's kind of the experience that we optimize for. You get Pixie installed, uh, and then what is the instant visibility you can get? And we've been primarily focused on uh, APM, which is like application performance monitoring and then debugging. And it's to provide this like baseline level of visibility and start to get into code level context. Um, although some of the people um, in the, you know, the broader Pixie community, um, like Yana at AWS, she's been looking at doing some security stuff with, with Pixie because um, our, our, our scripting system is pretty extendable. And I'll, I'll show that in a, in a second. Um, yeah, so the way Pixie works at a very high level is that we have these things called Pixie edge modules. It's a little hard to see over here. So let me just blow this up. Yeah. Cool. So we have these things called Pixie Edge modules, which install themselves as daemon sets and Kubernetes nodes. And then we have another uh, level called Vizier, um, which basically serves as our you know, semi-centralized data system. So our data system is split between you know, storage on the edge and then storage inside of, inside of the centralized collection system. And then we do have a cloud system to manage things like you know, authentication and RBAC and metadata search and, and, and stuff like that. Um, all components over here are actually open source. So you could launch your own private public or private Pixie cloud and then connect multiple clusters to it and get administration across them. Um, or you could use our like our essentially free like community hosting, which we have on, uh, uh, on Pixie Labs. And it basically just hosts the uh, open source version of Pixie for, for everyone to use. Um, yeah, so there are two, two main components of Pixie. Uh, as I mentioned, the cloud and the Vizier, both of these are available. Uh, and then we can interface with the CLI, uh, which is available on our GitHub repo over here, uh, the web UI or the APIs, um, which, are, which are either located in this directory or a copy in this repo. Uh, with that, you know, I'm just gonna dive into a quick, quick demo. So when you install Pixie, you can install Pixie with our CLI uh, once you install Pixie, uh, you can immediately, you know, within within a, a couple of minutes, uh, depending on how long it takes uh, Kubernetes to deploy all the all the services, uh, get visibility into um, into your application. So let me actually start with the cluster level view. Uh, so there are a bunch of services running on this cluster. Some of them have been making uh, connection or uh, requests out for services. Uh, you can get you know pretty deep inspection of what's going on. Right. So it says like how much traffic is going, how many errors, all that stuff. Everything over here was done without adding any manual instrumentation to the code uh, or relying on any instrumentation that's already in the code. Um, so I'll, I'll dive into something quickly like PLC, um, which is where Pixie Cloud is hosted on, on this account over here. Um, and you, know, you can actually go in and, and see like where the requests are being made. So over here, you can see that there's a proxy service that talks to the API service, which, you know, actually talks to the authentication service. Uh, so we basically discover all the, the graph and everything automatically. Um, if you want to dive into a specific service, you can, you can click in, uh, you can see which pods hosted, uh, get all the high level metrics, 
Uh, we can do things like this where it says sample of all the slow requests. Uh, you can actually open this up and you can see that there was a GraphQL request that was made. Uh, this was a query that was done. Uh, this is a response status and this is the response body. Um, it's been truncated uh, because it's, you know, it's long, uh, but we actually do like full body tracing of requests and uh, the system works uh, regardless of whether you're using SSL or not. Uh, so in most cases, even all of this traffic is actually SSL'd. Uh, so in most cases, we can actually capture the SSL traffic um, and, and be able to show you what it is. Um, diving in, you know, just uh, one of the things that we've been really into is getting code level context. So if you're trying to debug slow requests and you click on the API server, um, so you can see for the specific pod, um, how the specific pod is behaving. Um, if you notice like CPU usage spikes, you can narrow things down. Um, one of the things we, uh, we do is run continuous profiling in Pixie uh, using VPF. So if you ever run into a performance issue, you can go narrow down the time window and then see like, you know, where in your code uh, performance issues are happening. Um, so part of our like long-term goal is to try to make Pixie as like developer friendly as possible, which in our mind means like trying to get more and more code level stuff in, into Pixie. Uh, and being able to make it easier for, you know, engineers who are actually trying to debug performance issues to be like, oh, where in the code should I go and look? Um, I didn't want to dive into too many details of exactly how the flame chart works, but basically wider bars mean, you know, you're spending a lot of time over there, so it's a good area to go, go debug. Um, just to add a little thing on here, uh, you can actually see that our context starts in the entire cluster, goes to a specific pod, container, PID. Uh, we can actually profile across the entire cluster and tell you how, you know, different different pods have different performance profiles um to, if you if that's helpful for debugging um because you know one of the things that happens is in the cool. background sorry is there a question Winter, can you mute yourself please Yeah, Zane, do you want uh, questions in line or do you want to finish like a... I'm happy to take them in any order. I was just going to show like two more things quickly. Okay. Um, so one of the things I wanted to quickly show is that, you know, everything inside of Pixie is done using using scripts. So we have this like Python dialect pixel script. So you can go ahead and like, yeah, you know, it's, it's basically based on pandas. You can say, here's a data frame and then you can do all sorts of stuff on it. Um, our goal is to basically build up a bunch of scripts in the community where they already have a lot of them that you can run. Um, Cause kind of our, our long-term goal is to like be able to build workflows on like specific things or specific types of projects. Like, oh, I want to debug something that's slow in Kafka. Like what are the best things to look at and what is the right debug flow? So everything is done using this like Python, Python dialect that we compile and execute. Um, it's pretty powerful like in the sense that we can actually go and uh, this one is, is super ugly, uh, but here the code is actually from BP uptrace. Um, we want to trace the number of drop packets in the kernel. Um, so we can actually extend Pixie by creating like temporary, temporary tables. So this table will live for 10 minutes and trace for 10 minutes what all the TCP drops and stuff are. Um, so if you deploy this, um, hopefully uh, this will deploy. In a few seconds, um, we should be able to to actually get a graph of like all the TCP drops and requests that are being made across all the services and nodes. Um, you can go ahead and like aggregate it in like many different areas. In this case, it's basically aggregated by source and destination endpoints. Um, so, um, I guess to step back, we have the notion of like pre-built probes that we already have like always instrumented, but you can also add like temporary probes that you want to instrument and be able to, to capture data for. Um, some of the other functionality we have uh, for things like pre-built stuff is, let's say you want to take a look at Postgres data. Uh, so we support many, many different database protocols. So you can actually uh, see what, um, you know, uh, the, the exact Postgres queries are. So and like here's a, a Postgres query that was executed. Um, and then it was, it got parsed. So um, we have like this raw stream of like, here's all the Postgres events that are occurring. 
Uh, you can do similar things for you know MySQL or Mongo or various other databases that would support. So those are like the built-in features, uh, but then we're extendable by being able to add either BPF trace code or, or uh, dynamic tracing uh, to like specific points in your program. Um, I know I went through a lot, uh, but you know, feel free to ask me questions and then check it out and, and give us feedback. Uh, but uh, I'll stop over there. Yeah, that's amazing. It's it's, yeah. it's really fascinating what what you can do there. I I have one. Uh, I have two questions, but the one I'd really like to understand, and maybe you can help me with something, is that um, if you compare it with Hubble, like what are the the differences or the overlaps or when would you say use the one or the other is it totally different like what, what would you say in terms of comparing pixie with hubble yeah um let me see i'm trying to remember exactly which project the hubble would feel what, right it was a psyllium psyllium subproject yes this is essentially yeah. the same um like high level pitch in the sense of you know uh, using BPF to or BPF to um, provide that kind of insight. And yeah, I remember when Hubble was coming out. So Hubble, I think, came out like a little bit before we open source Pixie. Um, I think one of the main, or rather, a little bit before, uh, like right when we were launching Pixie as a as a as a product. Um, so I think the main differences are that Hubble is focused on generating metrics from the data. Uh, if I understand correctly, and we help you do a lot more of the raw analysis. Um, and I think in addition to the BPF stuff, uh, Pixie comes with like an entire data system behind it. Um, so like, you know, like I said, originally, we kind of come from this machine learning and data systems background. So for us, like BPF was like, how do we get lots of data into Pixie very quickly so we can actually do more things with it? So it, it kind of came from that direction, whereas I think Hubble's coming from the the other direction. So I, I definitely think like you know there's a future where they're both complementary, right, and, and can work together. Uh, one of the things that we're working on with Pixie is being able to export data in other formats like uh, Open Telemetry and, and all of that, so we can actually make it easily consumable by other tools. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I had a quick question, if I could briefly, um, also sort of around exporting. Uh, is there any facility in Pixie to kind of export not a continuous stream of things, but findings? So when you were talking about a systemic view across all pods of a cluster, for example, you know, you, you might be doing a right sizing ex, uh, experiment, right, where you're going from a staging cluster to a production cluster, and you want to put in place the right kind of quotas or resource limits based on actual performance, not you know, whatever defaults were either copy pasted or put in potentially um, uh, with what's running or or if you wanted to identify problematic areas and like generate some sort of actionable report that you could then give to a team and say, hey, everything seems to be working across these two dozen services, but these two are having problems, right? Or is there any kind of way to have a reporting feature or an export of findings? Yeah, so in some ways, you know, our first standard answer to that would be you should just write a script that'll export the findings and then you could stream the output of the script. Um, so we do have streaming support, right? So if you aggregate the data and say you want to do this over a 30 minute window or something, um, we are adding in the ability to manage like persistent, persistent scripts. So you can be like, hey, run the script in the background. And then, you know, obviously with flag errors of the script stops for some reason. But run the script in the background, and you know, if the script says every thirty minutes make a request somewhere to tell me, you know, give some update, then then the script will automatically do that. Um, or you could call the script to the API and just watch the results, or or call to the CLI and watch the results. Yeah, yeah, I was I was I was kind of thinking of you know when when running things at scale, um, you know, across multiple regions and things like that. You know, oftentimes at least from folks I've talked to, you have a, a fairly small team doing a whole lot of things. So if there was some way to kind of say, you know, of all the things happening, we've predefined these sort of alerts or conditions, um, you know, he, here's things to look at, or, you know, we want to we want to watch for, you know, some condition over the next two or three days as we roll something out across regions. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, I think that absolutely makes sense. Um, we haven't focused on those use cases, but that's actually been brought up to us many, many times from, from various, various people. Um, including like Kelsey was really trying to convince us to do resource optimization stuff. 
Uh, like we ultimately focused on like doing performance monitoring, but I think he's actually going to demo some resource optimization stuff in a couple of weeks using Clixie. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how that works out. But basically, he is going to write that script to watch resources and be able to adapt uh, adapt resources on, on Kubernetes. We have another question. Arthur asked regarding um, how CCleanliness works with stuff that runs outside. Uh, not in the cluster and i think that's that's a really good question right it's... yeah so the short answer is that as long as one of the network endpoints is located in the cluster uh you won't be able to tell the difference so if you have a database running outside of the cluster but the service is accessing it is inside the cluster it, it'll still work fine uh we will switch the requester we'll switch the tracing automatically from server side to client side uh, depending on, on um, which end is located within the cluster. Uh, we obviously can't get you like the uh, information about the database. Like, like, for example, we do like JVM metrics and stuff. You wouldn't be able to do that if, if it was running on a different node. Um, but over time, uh, we haven't really prioritized this, but this is highly requested is that we want to be able to run our pens, which is our daemon set on like an arbitrary Linux VM, and be able to phone home the data to, as long as you have one Kubernetes cluster, you can have as many VMs as you want. Uh, we do rely on Kubernetes to host our data system, and it's, it's pretty hard for us to move away from that. But as long as you have one Kubernetes cluster, you can connect as many Linux VMs as you want to. Thank you. Got a quick question coming from the Prometheus world. Um, I usually care about uh, alerting a lot. So I'm just curious how much uh, focus there is in Pixie on alerting, or is it just like really like a debug tool for the most part to, to troubleshoot once actually something happened? Yeah, it's a little bit more of the latter. I, I guess I should have been a little bit more clear about this up front, but Pixie doesn't do long term retention and it doesn't do things like alerting. Our goal is to be able to collect lots of data for a short period of time and then be able to help you work through it and process a large volume of data at low overhead. So, you know, after the data gets through Pixie, our goal will be to like export this to like Prometheus or Loki or, or whatever, where they can get converted to metrics and you could have like, you know, months, months of metrics. So that's part of the reason we don't really see ourselves as competitive, right? Because we, we serve this like very narrow niche of like debug tools. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Thanks. So are you saying that there's a plan or there already is the ability to effectively treat Pixie as an exporter of sorts from a Prometheus perspective? Like you're, you've got this sea of data from that you could derive interesting time series either directly or by computing rates live kind of thing and, and then providing a, a scrapable endpoint. Is that what you meant by exporting to? That, that's right, or yeah. Or I mean like a data transformation where you're writing, you know, directly to a local instance and then exporting it or something like that? Um, our goal will be more of the former, which is like you have a script that's basically generating metrics from all this data. And then that those metrics can then get exported to Prometheus, uh, either by us exposing an endpoint or through some push gateway or, or something. We haven't quite uh, figured that out yet. There is a prototype of it that basically used the Prometheus push gateway, um, but we're open to suggestions. So I'd love to talk after that. We, we've written a Prometheus aggregating push gateway for metrics from our front end for the same thing where we needed to get some visibility. Um, but yeah. we, had, we had the problem of way too much data, so we aggregated versus a standard push gateway. But... Awesome. But it sounds like more important questions, so you might want to speak with Ivan from today's uh, presentation. Uh, but anyway, yeah, thank you for, for explaining this. This is um, quite epic. I, I wonder what it is involved to install um, eBPF kind of instrumentation inside my cluster. What should I do? I have Kubernetes cluster and, you know, what steps do I need to do to ensure that uh, things are installed properly? And, um, you know, the, the Pixie knows how my service is actually named and what service endpoints I really care to uh, uh, you know, a record, right? Because maybe I want to care about a couple of APIs. Yeah, so right now we record everything. Um, we plan to provide like more configuration around don't record this or record more info about this stuff. Uh, but in the current state, you know, we connect to the Kubernetes API and discover all the services and pods and everything. So it's all transparent. Uh, like it actually only takes about like, 
you know, two or three minutes in Salt Pixie. And like those dash, like the dashboards I showed you were not like specifically configured. They just should automatically work on those clusters. Um, we do have some challenges with certain things like, you know, running on things like Kind, like Kubernetes Kind can be very challenging for us because, you know, Kind actually runs on your local Linux machine and they can, it can be pretty challenging, but like typical like Kubernetes clusters, even on Minikube, um, or GKE or AKS or whatever EKS, we don't have any issues with self-hosted. Okay, nice, uh, thank you. We do, we do need, um, I believe currently we require uh, Linux kernel more than 4.12. Um, Michelle, is that right or is it 4.15? I, I can't remember for sure, but I think it might be 4.15. Yeah. They're all they're all relatively old at this point. Like four fifteen is still like several years old. Uh, what's the what's the overhead? Like I instrument everything. Uh, like yeah. That. So that 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 question varies because we're we're continuously optimizing things. Our goal is to stay under five percent to get like full instrumentation. Mm -hmm. uh, the continuous profiler, for example, is about half a percent overhead if you just use the continuous profiler. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's pretty constant. It'll use up half a percent of your CPU, regardless of what your server load is. Um, and um, typically for the network tracing, you know, we see like somewhere between two to 4%. Mm -hmm. On typical servers, if you have some like really high performance service that's making like thousands of requests per second, then it'll, it'll probably consume more. Mm -hmm. So it's proportional also uh, with the uh, with the traffic more or less. So the regular like the network tracing and the database stuff is proportional with the traffic. The continuous profiler is is independent of the traffic mm -hmm. or independent of load because we basically do stack sampling. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's like a constant overhead even if the server level. Mm -hmm. the, is the data model underneath Pixie like where you're storing your? But both in node local storage, but also elsewhere, is that one security domain, if you will? Like, is it sort of you have access to all the things or not? You know, with TVPF, obviously, you can get inside SSL tunnels, you can access all kinds of yep. things. And when combined with a script, like, you know, this is basically uh, God mode plus visibility. <laughs> right? Yeah, so, yeah, that, that's what we call it. We call it like God mode true. visibility for clusters. Um, our our goal is to actually. Like that. Sorry, Matt. I, I think I spoke over you. What, what, what you were saying it was just a plans for adding more security. Uh, well, no. I, I was curious if currently there's an RBAC model, or if there are any ways to compartmentalize the data, either to have some of it be. Uh, yeah, is, is it just like you have access to all or nothing, or is there a security uh, framework or model to allow for protecting some of the data that may be sensitive? Uh, right now it's, it's, uh, it's much closer to all or nothing. We do want to move to an RBAC model where we can even restrict people from accessing certain tables or even like certain fields within certain tables, but we are not there yet. So for example, we could prevent users from accessing encrypted traffic. Uh, but we're not, we're not, uh, we're not there yet. Uh, but that's something that, that is on our, on our roadmap and plans to build out because it's, it's obviously very important as, as we scale out. Sure, sure. And um, I know we're getting short on time. This has been fascinating. I could, I could watch this all day, but uh, how should people uh, get involved if they're interested in this? Say they, say they want to play with it or they have ideas or they want to make it better or they want to, you know. Yeah. So I'd say like kind of like three things, right? One is like you know, someone pointed out there's a Slack community. So please uh, join the Slack community. Um, I didn't, you know, there, it'll be super, super helpful for us to get feedback over there. And it's, it's an area where you can have a lot more discussion with somebody on our team. Uh, the other thing is to, um, the other thing is to, you know, file GitHub issues. Uh, we're not very actively um, asking for contributions yet, but there's some area that you're really interested in working on, like file an issue and we'll figure out a, figure out a process for that. Uh, we will be opening up for much more active contributions in a, in a couple of months. It's just that we're trying to get everything organized and, and figured out because, you know, we started out as a, as a SaaS product and we're trying to make everything open source. So there's some, some work over there, to be honest. That's commendable, by the way. Um, and also, um, uh, the other thing I want to point out is, you know, feel free to use the community version of Pixie. Uh, there is no, like, there is no plans for us to, like, you know, add, like, Pixie upsell features or anything like that. Um, I think the only thing that we're going to have in the community version over time is like, you can, 
you know, you might want to export your data to some other service or whatever, but we don't plan to, to do any like pixie upsell. We plan to build all of our stuff in the open source. Cool. Is any, Thanks, Matt. Is there any roadmap? Any plans, any major features that you are looking for, maybe for someone to contribute or, or something like that? Yeah, so I think there are a couple of areas that we're very actively, uh, you know, in the short term could actually use help on. So one of them is we're working on a Grafana plugin for Pixie, um, right, to be able to get, you know, part of our thing is we want to be able to work with all the other tools in the ecosystem. Uh, like our goal is not to build like a, you know, amazing UI or something, right? We have a UI for debugging, but we want people to be able to use Grafana and other popular tools. We're probably actually going to flip the switch on the Grafana repo like today. So very happy to get contributions and, and help on that. Um, the other thing, obviously, uh, I think, as we mentioned, is the Prometheus side. Uh, we'd love to get some help on, on figuring out what the right way to do that is. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Michael, I interrupted you. Sorry. Amazing. Thank you. No worries. Keep it up. Any other questions before we break? We're almost at time. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, um, to everyone uh, who, who had questions and discussion and for their presentations themselves. This is really exciting stuff to see. Um, and I will see you all online uh, and next week. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.